The architects have this ability to be able to solve problems, who problem solvers essentially. The problem is that we focus our problems on a very, very narrow set. Episode 72. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. This week I'm in East London, I'm in Old Street, and I'm in the offices of RCKAs. So this interview was a real fantastic one for me. I, I love Russell Curtis. I watch and listen to his tweets and his videos, and he's very vocal in the architectural industry, and he's been a very passionate advocate for increased transparency in the public sector procurement process in the UK. He's actually one of the founding directors or of Project Compass. Um, and he's also one of the co-founders of RKCA. And his sort of role there is um, he oversees commercial and residential infill projects and is responsible for the delivery phase of most of the practices work. Um, and he also, it's worth noting, he also sits on the design review panels for LLDC and London boroughs of Croydon and Newham and is one of the mayor's design advocates. Um, and this was a really great interview because we got to talk about some of the failings of procurement in the UK, how difficult it is for young practices to get involved in public work and the constraints that that has around it, how how architects have kind of slowly lost and let go, relinquished some of our leadership, our stewardship, our role within the built environment and how it's kind of been eaten away at all these other sorts of uh, peculiar industries and really how we're not communicating the value of what it is that we do as architects, particularly over the lifetime of a building. And I think this is a very profound point that Russell draws upon and illustrates in this conversation about that's one of the things that we can start to draw attention to is that when we are focused on the entire longevity and big picture scale thinking of what we do as architects and the value that we bring to the built environment, this begins to put us in a very different position and can start to change the way that uh, that we are negotiating, the way that we are controlling our roles in the construction industry. So sit back, relax and enjoy my conversation with Russell Curtis. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work, but it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself. We can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of. And I'd also love to hear more about your business what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business-wise in 2020. So there's no charge or any obligation with this call, just simply to find out how our content has been of value. And if we get that far, and with your permission, of course, what might be next, what might be possible, and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15-minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Russell, welcome to the show. Good morning. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Um, you are the founder of, or one of the three founders of RCK a architects that's right you're also one of the founding members of project compass which is campaigning that's towards right. better procure, better procurement yeah um and we were talking just just now over a cup of coffee you were talking about how your practice has kind of found its identity or there's been this kind of journey of you uncovering who it is that you actually are as architects yes and i thought that was a really interesting kind of realization actually that mm -hmm. a lot of businesses might never actually make uh is right. that is that you know, we often we often have a vision of what it, of who we think we should be in mm -hmm. in practice and the types of work that we should be doing, and you know that can often be a painful experience if we're going down that route. So, mm -hmm. from your perspective, how how did it begin, and how have you kind of you know what's been your journey of uncovering your identity as a practice? Okay, well we 
We set up on the back of winning uh, Europan, uh, the last time it was run in the UK. Um, we had an idea over the years of working together and we'd done some bits of private work in evenings and weekends, which was, uh, which was really painful. Um, but we had this idea of, of, of working together and we won Europan. And we then won an RBA competition. Um, and I think what was, what was interesting, looking back on it now, um, was how at the time we were interested in things and looking back in hindsight how there's a, a consistent journey that we've taken even though that wasn't a conscious journey. So I remember um, after winning Europan we they, 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 there's a sort of book produced, a publication with all of the projects in. So, if, so if people don't know, what is Europan? So Europan is a, is a is a sort of a, a cross, uh, well, a pan-European uh, design competition for architects under the age of forty. Um, so it, it's, uh, it's been running for, for for many years, although there hasn't been any sites or any entries. Uh, in the UK since since we won it, so uh, and we'll come on to that because that's I think that sort of talks about the UK's attitude to young architects. Um, so uh, so Europan is a, is a big it's mainly a housing design competition, but it runs across Europe on 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 seventy or eighty sites or something like that. So all the winners at the end of the uh, and the runners up at the at the end of the competition get published in a book with their entries. And accompanying that is um, a, is, a, is a, a photograph of, of the winning team, and we uh, we commissioned a, a friend of ours to take some photographs of us. And, and it was interesting at the time. We thought, okay, we, we we just set up. We're doing house extensions, kitchen extensions. We had no work when we first set up. The first day, I. I Worked for myself. I sat down. I thought, "What am I going to do now? Uh, I, be I better learn how to use SketchUp." So I taught myself how to. The first week, I taught myself how to use SketchUp. So we set up without having any money behind us, without having any work behind us, and we were constantly thinking, "Who who is it? We who is it? We should be mm. as architects." We we came from a three different uh, three three of us came from very different backgrounds, different types of practice, different types of work. So there was no kind of cons there was no singular vision about who we wanted to be. So we got these photographs uh, uh, taken for a few, and we dressed up in uh, awful suits. And uh, well, Dieter did. Dieter's always been very stylish, so he looked great. He looks great in the photographs even now. But I'm I'm embarrassed to look at the photograph. Now. <laughs> a terrible pinstripe suit, a shirt and tie, uh, and and I think what we were we were thinking about or we were trying to project an image of who we thought we should be not who we were mm. and over the years as our work has uh, as we've done more work we've won more work as our work has progressed it's become a much clearer uh, that all, there was from the very beginning uh, an interest um, but we're much more comfortable now in who we are and and what what kind of work we want to do, uh, which I don't think was was uh, was something that we 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 re even considered at the beginning. Mm. So there was no there was no kind of conversation where you sat down and were like, right, we want to we want these types of ideal projects. No, or, or here's what we're interested not in. At, not at all. Not at all. And and there was no plan like that. We just thought, well, we can't we can't really plan for that because. We don't. Uh, we don't have any. We don't have anybody giving us work. We've got to go out and win the work. Yeah. And as a young practice, uh, even though you may have delivered huge projects uh, previously for other people, day one, unless you've got a track record, there's no chance of of, w of winning projects. So you do what you can. So you go out and you you know you market yourself and you do. Uh, you know, you go to the, the, all of the sort of the the, the events like uh, Don't Move Improve and things like that. You do workshops for people, kitchen extensions. You know, we had some we had some great clients, some 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 wealthy clients uh, who uh, kept us going through a few years as we did sort of nice house extensions in in um, in Hampstead and places. But it, I don't think we ever thought that was us. Mm. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that, but it just it it, it was just something that we were doing. Uh, in order to sort of explore the things that we were interested in. Um, and then what's happened, particularly over the last sort of five or six years, is that we, we're in a position now where we're doing much more public work. 
all of our work at the moment pretty much is, is, is public by, by, by fee income. Um, and that's, uh, I mean, that's, that's, that was never really a conscious decision, but I think that we've sort of found ourselves doing that because it aligns with a lot of the interests that we have now as a, as a business. And how did you begin to make that transition from kind of private residential work into the public sector? And what were the obstacles that you had to navigate around? Well, I, the obstacles were huge. Um, and even now, it's extremely difficult for a practices of our size and, um, uh, and age uh, to win decent-sized public commissions. Mm. Um, and, you know, I think we were, we were lucky because we want to... We won a significant project um, with uh, Lewisham Council, our, our, um, our uh, TNG Youth and Community Centre, which we started work on, working on in 2009. So it's quite an early project for us. Um, and that came out of some experience that Dieter had had with a particular uh, the My Place funding round, which was a government fund. So we were approached to do that project and it turned into a, you know, a really great building. We got a lot of press for it, got a lot of awards for it. Um, and that was really the, the catalyst for this move into, the, into public sector work. Um, but that was an exception. Mm. Uh, and at the time, we were still doing lots of domestic projects. Um, and it, even, even with that under our belt, it still took a very, very long time to, to be able to move uh, more, um, more consistently into the, into, the, uh, into the public sector. Mm. Um, so, And one of my frustrations is that... Uh, it's so difficult for young architects to win public work. Yeah, um, I mean that's you know it just and it, it it shouldn't be and it re- it really is. Why? What what why, what do you think are the sort of the main obstacles or the constraints in the system or the framework that prevents young practices from? Because this is something that so many young practices like yeah. they've got a real urge, a real consciousness about what it is they want to do. They want to be able to be contributing and using their yes. skills yes. in the public sector. Yes. And it's almost impenetrable. Yes, like absolutely. It, it's just like I don't even know where to begin. Absolutely, absolutely, and I, 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 you're absolutely right. And I think the um, the, the principal reason is that uh, the public sector, for for very um, good reasons, is incredibly risk averse. Yeah. So, if you think from the minds of a procurement officer. You know, who am I going to get to do this project? Is it going to be somebody who has delivered loads of the same, loads of that type of building before, or is it going to be some untested young studio have set up, you know, six months ago? Have no, you know, I mean, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. The thing is, we're asking the wrong questions. There, the, the questions that are being asked is all about have they done it before, and not can they do it better. Mm. And we need to find ways that. Um, that allow those questions to be asked, whilst also being conscious of you know the uh, of, 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 uh, of limited public money and funding and all that sort of stuff. So I, I get it, but we, we the emphasis is, is wrong at the moment. I think in, in in how we go about procuring public buildings. And what what are how can architects begin to kind of change that conversation? What do you think is our role in being able to shift or change the questions that are being asked? I think what's interesting is looking at um, the way that architecture, the profession of architecture, is evolving. Um, we're seeing a, mu- a much greater interest in uh, in architecture as a public discipline, as a public service, and. We all know that a practicing architecture is much more than just designing lovely buildings. I mean, it's you know we 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 have a, we we we're influ- influential over things like public you know policy, housing policy, economics, social policy, all those sort of things. We have we have agency over, and I'm interested to see how a lot of um, young architects, in particular. Are embracing this and moving into the public sector, and also taking up jobs which aren't architectural positions. Mm. So, th- so commissioning clients, you know, yeah. actually well, them, them becoming clients. Um, I mean, the GLA has been particularly good at this. They've got some really great people now um, who understand these kind of challenges. And I think that we need to look at, look outside architecture with a capital A and look at it as a, as a much more wider social discipline. Um, and and, th- and that's how we do it because we can't reform it from outside. You have to be you have to be in there. You have to be uh, you know at the coal face, 
steering the decision making yeah. uh, and, and making sure that the questions that are being asked when you're going through this kind of process are the right ones to get the right it, th- that's, that's really interesting actually because it starts to assert a kind of propositional architect or it opens up a lot of different avenues as well, particularly mm. like, you know, you know, in terms of being entrepreneurial or yes. becoming the client. Yes. Like, and actually, when we start speculating about what it is actually to be the client, mm. and if we're going in being a client and our focus is not solely on just profit, but actually yes. on contributing to, you know, we want to deliver great architecture because we yeah. love it. That's what, yes. we're, that's what we're into. Yes. And actually, all the skill sets that come that are involved with that as well mm. actually makes us better architects. I agree, yes. And, and kind of it furthers a, a very interesting conversation. Yeah, I, I, I agree completely. I think it's, um, you know, we we, we we have an opportunity. I think particularly now we have an opportunity as architects to have much greater influence over... Uh, you know the direction our, our, our towns and cities uh, make, not just in terms of their the, the physical uh, nature of them, the environmental nature, but the social nature of, their, of them, which I think you know we really we have to grasp, and it's really exciting. And I think what's what's uh, what we've we've come to realise as a practice is that if you look back at our early uh, our early projects, uh, such as our Europan scheme, this thread that links them all together is an interest in. Uh, in, in social value, social interaction, um, how to in, how to uh, how to focus design around uh, communities. Our, our, our uh, the TNG uh, youth centre, for example, is really just an infrastructure. It's an infrastructure for activity. We were very careful that the building should um, not prescribe or not limit the activities that take place in it. Actually, mm. it's, the, it's a building for the kids that use it. And they should be able to inhabit and adopt it as they see fit. And so all we're doing is setting out an infrastructure. And I think we, we looking back at our earlier projects, that's a common theme amongst all of them, that all we're doing is providing an infrastructure. It's not about architecture. I mean, actually, the, the doing, doing beautiful buildings is the easy bit. The allowing people to live their lives uh, and giving them the space and the freedom and the opportunities to to go about their lives in a you know a safe and comfortable and uh, beautiful environment is uh, is the difficult bit, and that's that's what we're really really interested in. And stepping back a little bit and, and looking at the procurement process, because mm. there's something you you've become quite an advocate for is, yes. is procurement reform. Yes. And in the UK, we seem to have. I mean, how does it differ in the UK so compared to the rest of Europe about how their commissioning work, how work is getting built in the... And I, and I understand, like, you know, the, <clears throat> the amount of work that gets done through OJU in the UK is yes. quite disproportionate to lots of other countries. Correct. I mean, it, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's, not all, um, it's not all sort of uh, uh, completely different in, in, in Europe. It varies from country to country, clearly. Yeah. Um, the... That we what what happens in the UK is that we do have a very unhealthy relationship with uh, with OJU and 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 o, so OJU for people who don't know is basically a set of procurement rules set out by the European Union uh, which uh, which place certain requirements on public bodies uh, to to, um, to to go about things in a fair and transparent manner. What we've done in the UK, we've taken those rules and. All of the things that are optional, we've made mandatory. So we 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 call it sort of um, uh, it's it, it it's 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 mandate. It's become something uh, gold plating. We gold plate everything. So uh, and in Europe, so in France, uh, everything go everything every public scheme goes through a competitive process. Okay, so you, it's so much so much more opportunity for young architects. Because uh, it's all about design. Mm. It's all about the quality of the design. In the UK, what tends to happen is the focus is all on track record, financial stability, uh, levels of insurance, health and safety, all those sort of things. It's a kind of which focus on that cost. The fo- the it's a focus on the cost. It's focus. It's basically focused on things that you can quantify, that you can measure, which is hugely exclusionary. Uh, and we put huge amounts in this country through the OGU process. So... You know, I, I know for, I know from experience that you know there are lots of countries that suffer from these same problems um, uh, 
Ireland, I think, in particular, is it, it has a very similar profile to our own. But I think the the, the problem with this is that we look at my, my interest is is how do our buildings perform for the people that are going to live in them? And the fundamental for all use them. The fundamental problem with UK procurement in particular is that it puts these barriers in between the architect and the end user mm. so that you'll be uh, there'll be a procurement officer for example sitting in a local authority who will say right I need to I know I need to get an architect for this particular project and they'll go out and they'll run some convoluted procurement process and at the conclusion of that stage their work's done so they will then hand the architect over to the uh, to the client team, and the client will then commission the or, or engage them and and and, uh, and proceed with the project. And then what happens is they'll do uh, they'll work up uh, they'll get planning permission. They'll then work up a, a tender information, and then they'll go out to some another convoluted procurement process to appoint a contractor. I mean, the the architect may or may not be taken on by the contractor. So there's another step, another degree of separation from the end user, and all yeah. of the time. Nobody's really focusing on the people that are going to be living in or using these buildings, uh, and that seems insane to me. That that we that re- that relationship that uh, that 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 thread should be consistent all the way through the projects. And then what happens is they build the, they build the thing, the contractor gets paid, they sort out the final account, and then you know nobody's coming back in a year, five years, ten years, and looking how the building's performing because nobody's interested in that bit. Yeah, and that's the bit where all the value is. It's crazy. It's it's kind of so short sighted. It's incredibly short sighted, and uh, the 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 RIBA uh, has a uh, so the, the plan of work, which is the structure that we use for um, for projects, uh, which goes from zero to seven, and it's supposed to be a circular process. So you know, if you think about Apple or any sort of big manufacturer. Um, each each phone that you buy every year or every couple of years is uh, is an evolution of the last one. So you learn all the lessons. You you, build, you make a phone. You know you've got all this data. You uh, uh, you know how you know what things that people like, things that people don't like, which bits lasted a long time, which bits didn't. And at the end of that, you produce a new phone, mm. learning from the lessons that you've that, that, that you've you've got from from the previous iteration. That just doesn't happen in buildings. It's insane. It's insane that we get to the end of the process and then everybody disappears uh, and nobody's measuring the performance of the building. And so we can't feed that back into the, back into the loop. So the ROBA's idea that this becomes a cyclical process, mm. you go through all the stages of a project, you get to stage seven, you do what we call post-occupancy evaluation, you measure the performance of the building, and then that's then supposed to feed into... Uh, into the the briefing for the next building it just doesn't happen it's a linear process Mm. and the procurement system in particular prevents us from doing that that's frightening it's absolutely it's frightening and and it's also kind of i mean you you use a good example of like apple of how their products are sort of these closed loop systems and once you're in their kind of ecosystem you're in it and it's kind of they will in their 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 impetus their their business impetus is yeah. to ensure that those products are always getting better and better so you yes. don't so you don't Absolutely. leave yeah, yeah. and likewise with buildings we want to be able to have some sort of accountability for how those buildings are performing mm-hmm. how they're getting better over and over their life yeah. their lifespan yeah. and being able to use that as a demonstration of value for the next project yes because once that kind of data is there and recorded it's something again it's like a marketing collateral it's yes it's an incredibly powerful and compelling argument to yeah. to start demonstrating yeah. the value of architects yeah. and, and the thing is you know how do you know whether a building is you know if it's we, we can we set out the beginning with a brief and it might say that it's you know it's got needs a certain let's say it's a, house, a housing scheme in a certain number of flats uh, of a particular mix of units it needs to achieve uh, you know, building regulations, or or it needs to have a certain energy performance. Um, we're not not consistently going back and measuring those things and seeing whether it's we're seeing seeing whether it's actually performing against the brief. Mm. Um, is this yeah. a, is this something that we can do as individual architects with our own with our own projects? Is, well, we're, is we're doing it. We're doing it ourselves. We we are now funded. One of the big problems is it's very difficult to get our, get clients to pay for that bit. Yeah. Work. Um, so, so we are, as a practice, going back and doing it ourselves 
to some of our old, older buildings that we finished five or six years ago. Mm. Uh, and what we're interested in is not only how buildings are performing in terms of our environmental uh, performance, because that's easy because you measure it. We want to know from the people that are using them what they like about them, what they don't like about them. You know, does the do they like the way? You know, is it nice? It, do they have a nice outlook? Do they? Does the sun come up in a, in, a, in a in a you know pleasant place? And does it shine on their kitchen table in the mornings? Or you know, do they meet their neighbours? How many of their neighbours do they know? All these sort of things, which are incredible. The reason we don't do it generally is because it's incredibly difficult to quantify. Yeah. So it's all anecdotal and. Um, it's useful for us, but it's very difficult for to, to be able to compare different projects, and that's I think the reason why we we haven't done that as a profession. We haven't you we know, haven't embedded that into the into the mm. into the process. But for most people, that's the most important thing. Yeah, when you think about what you like about your house. It's not things that you can measure. Mm. Yeah, so it's the emotive. It's yeah, exactly. It's, how it makes it's, you the, feel. it's the relationship you have with it. And, yeah, and, you know, and and the. Um, and, and the views that you have, and you know, all those kind of, th- all those sort of little little moments. That, that uh, and it's interesting because when we look at how the built environment gets, in, uh, you know, the, the role of developers or uh, investors in, in in doing buildings, and how perhaps their marketing or their market research might look at, you know, what is the market need for yeah. certain types of housing. Yeah. And as architects, you know, you we end up having to design in two very tight constraints, yeah. financial constraints. Yeah. <clears throat> which is all governed by things that are quantifiable, yes. like the amount of floor area yeah, that, exactly. uh, that yes, there is. Yes, yeah, and then, width, and so then it's a constant stuff. fight. Yeah, and then yeah. that's what our our role then gets reduced to, yeah. is trying to make stuff fit into stuff. Yeah, yeah. And But that data of actually showing, here's actually what the end user enjoys and likes, is mm. incredibly... And there's a, there's a powerful financial argument for that in terms of like the front end of it, as well as the lifespan of it. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, I think there is the the, the problem is where, where the analogy or the, the the analogy between the you know the iPhone or whatever and and, and buildings falls down is that um, the phone market is a buyer's market, you know, and you, and, and if and if you and if you can find a superior product, because uh, you'll probably only have it for a couple of years mm. and you will you know discard it after after two years. That doesn't apply to the housing market. The housing market is very much a seller's market. Uh, and we know that because the supply is throttled, um, people people don't really have much of a choice, mm. particularly at the lower and middle end. Right. Uh, so it, it's dysfunctional because there is there is no there is no choice really uh, because you know you'll be you'll, you know you'll go to an estate agent and say oh, well, I've got a great two bed flat. You know, all you're interested in is, all they all they're really interested in is is the fact that it's got two bedrooms. You know, and it might be south facing, or it might be on the you know on the top floor or something. Yeah. But actually, the, the there isn't the, the choice for the house. There isn't the choice to yeah, be able to say, I well, actually, I've got you know, I I've got you know fifteen or twenty options, and I'm going to choose that one because of you know of X, um, and that's and that's a real problem. That's a real problem, I think, um, because pe- people are not given the opportunity to, to make those uh, those decisions. Mm. And so your work with Project Compass, how are you? What, what, how did that begin, and what are you addressing there? Well, the it came out of a frustration with how difficult it was for us to win public work. You know, I, we had a we had a, a real desire to be doing work with the public sector, and you know we we entered we entered lots of competitions uh, we were doing um we were doing lots of uh, tender submissions for for things in hindsight and there was no 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 way in hell we were ever going to get them because you know there are lots of great practices out there why would you choose us because we have no track record and we you know so 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 that was a, that was a frustration and i and i but it felt like even at that point, that there, there was a fundamental issue in the in the in the procurement process that projects were not being matched with appropriate practices. Now, clearly, you know, if you've set up, you know, you've only been set up for a year or two, nobody's going to give you a you know five hundred unit housing development to do. But you're quite capable of doing a small community centre or a you know a whatever it is or a, a, a small project some of some description. Mm. Yet, those projects were going to practices which were clearly uh, unsuitable 
simply because they had a track record and or they, they, they had they had particular you know turnover or whatever so so it was born out of that frustration um, and I think increasingly I've become aware that that that, uh, that, that of course because you'd say well well poor architects you know what a hard life I and mean, you can't you know you're doing these you know big schemes for rich clients in in St John's Wood or whatever um, and you want to do a bit of you know a bit a bit of bit of public work and you can't get it I mean it, you know but actually what's become apparent is that the failure of public procurement is that we are it's not about the architect winning work it's about the failure to deliver buildings which are right uh, you know are safe and are mm. uh, comfortable for the people that are going to live in them uh, and and i think that that my my interest now in particular is trying to find ways that we can that we can uh, reform that yeah. That process. So, well, we, we see the very serious impacts of that, like you were saying, with things like Grenfell. And, yeah, you know, I mean, there's, and there's so many examples now, and and, and I, you know, I wonder in the next few years how many of the how many further examples or projects like this will come to light. But you know, Grand, Grenfell was particularly, uh, obviously, a, a, you know, a huge tragedy. Um, there are many other examples which are less catastrophic uh, of these kind of these kind of things. So there was, a, you know, a huge issue in in, in Edinburgh in Scotland with uh, 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 the, the schools program, mm. you know, where um, ox gangs was the first, but there were many fundamental problems for, uh, found with 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 uh, with a whole series of schools that were built. Um, Bridport House in Hackney was in the press this week. Um, Orchard Village is another one where um, people's lives are being blighted by poor quality buildings. And it's, it's an issue of oversight. There is nobody responsible for, responsible for making sure that those buildings are being built properly. Um, and I think the, the frustration is that uh, the... The, the, this, I talked about risk earlier. That the, the risk is seen by the public sector of a project going over budget, not whether it's going to perform or whether it's going to be you know knocked down or hugely refurbished in five or ten years after it's opened. You know, and that and because no, because the officers are li- unlikely to be around at that point. Mm. You know, they'll have moved somewhere else. So their focus is very much on you know, can we get the architects fee down? Can we build this as cheaply as possible? Uh, and, and you know, and get and get out, rather than you know, what does this what does this building perform like? And I think the my my big frustration with uh, with with all of the work's been do, do, doing uh, done around Grenfell is that nobody seems to be asking questions about procurement. Hmm. You know, why was it procured in that particular way? In fact, it was procured in a way that most public buildings are procured through a design and build process where. A certain stage, the project is given over to a contractor to 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 build, to design and build. The architect takes it to a certain point, and then the contractor takes those drawings, probably finishes them off, and then is responsible for delivering it. Now, in in her review uh, of the uh, of the Grenfell tragedy, uh, Dame uh, Judith Hackett talks about a golden thread. Um, that we need to find the golden thread that that uh, uh, that, that runs through an entire project um, to make sure that, that, that you know that, 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 that information is transferred consistently from one stage to, a ne- to the next. Now, I don't think that I think that's wrong. I think that the golden thread is not just information. It's not a data exercise. The golden thread has to be quality. It has to be. It has to be somebody taking responsibility for the the management of quality through the entire process. Because information could be, you know, well, we, we decided on this. We decided on this bit of cladding, and it, you know, has this technical performance. And somebody, the next person in the chain, picks that up and says, "Oh, well, okay. Well, I can see that it's this particular cladding. Maybe there's an alternative that performs the same. Uh, we'll use that instead because it's a bit cheaper, or whatever." What they won't understand is the wider implications of why that particular product was chosen, for mm. example. And what tends to happen now is that an architect will be chosen to get planning. If they're lucky, they'll then be appointed to produce tender drawings. 
at that point, um, the, uh, the, 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 the client will go out and find a contractor. The contractor will say, well, I will build this for you for X, and that's fixed. Yeah. They may take out, they may have the architect, uh, they may then employ the architect, original architect, they may not. And there's no obligation, often there's no obligation for them to do so. Um, and then the architect becomes a subcontractor to the main contractor. And so there's no contractual relationship back to the client, and certainly not to the people who are going to be, uh, uh, you know, going to be living in or using that building. Mm. So all of that knowledge that the architect has built up from the beginning is lost. And they're probably not in a position where they can go to site and say, I'm sorry, Mr. Contractor, but that's crap. You've built that wrongly. That's not in accordance with our drawings. You have to do it again. That used to be the case. Yeah. Now it's not. So, you know, so as a result of this, we're seeing the failure of these buildings where there's been no independent oversight. And I think that's a, you know, that's a fundamental issue. And, and actually, that's what, it, that's what this my frustration with procurement comes down to. Why, why have architects let go of that or how how is it you know what what can we do to regain kind of leadership in these yeah. positions and you know what as as young practices as mature practices as an industry yeah how can we start to kind of claim back some of this communicate the sort of the the gross inadequacies yeah. that are being delivered with buildings and the impact that it's actually having on communities in our built environment uh yeah i think what what happened was this goes back maybe uh, maybe sort of 30, 30 odd years. That in the in the uh, mid uh, early mid nineties, there was a series of reports uh, produced by um, Egan and Latham, and they saw the uh, the construction industry, the con- the, the, con- the construction pro- building process being too, far too adversarial. Right. under a traditional form of contract. So the traditional form of contract would be where the client employs an architect to be their representative through the entire process. And they are responsible for making sure that the contractor is doing the work properly. So the, um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the early 90s, there were these reports came out by um, Latham and Egan, which said that the uh, construction process was too adversarial. And uh, in a traditional, in a tr- traditional form of contract, so which is where an architect is employed by a by a client, and they are appointed uh, through the whole pro for the pro- whole process. Yeah. Uh, and re- and remain the client's representative right through to the end of the project. And under this uh, under these reports, what they recommended was that the um, the, 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 the whole process should be more collaborative. Actually, what happened was the contractors took all the, took all the power. So there was a transfer of power from the architect who cared about quality to the contractors who care about profit. Yep. And the, the power shifted too far in the other direction. So we end up with this position where you bring a contractor on board much earlier in the process. That was the idea that they could contribute to the um, they could con- contribute their knowledge to the, the process. But um, what's happened is that we've basically offloaded all the risk onto the contractors, mm. and we you know we've kind of we've allowed that to happen. It's not entirely our fault because it, it seems like a good idea. Intuitively, it seems like a good idea. Yeah, but in reality. We end up in this position where we've relinquished control, and we've relinquished, we've relinquished that opportunity to make sure that the buildings are performing in the way that they should. Yeah. So it's, uh, and I, I think the the as I said earlier, the way that this needs to be addressed is that architects need to take a greater role in the process as clients, and and, and that would then be an opportunity for us to. You know, to, to sort of uh, rethink about how we how we do, how we how we build buildings, make sure mm. the quality is, is consistent. Is there other examples in in other countries which you would look at? You mentioned France earlier, where they have got this process working a lot more smoothly, or where yeah. or where the design is. And is there, is there things that we can kind of borrow or learn from 
from our European... Maybe. I think, I mean, it's, it's, there's slightly different issues because in, in what happens in France with, um, with public buildings is that they have... Um, the selection of the architect is, is uh, through... A, a comp generally through design competition. Right. So you, pro you're pro you, you propose uh, what the building's going to look like. Now, um, or some ideas about what the building might look like. Now, the issue with that is, in, the, in, in France, they have hundreds of these things. Because of so, volume. Of, because of the volume of competition. Yeah. So architects will be submitting, uh, a, you know, because a lot of work goes into these, these, these submissions. So an architect will be submitting a, um, a scheme, or an idea, and they might be one of ten or something. Um, so it works. And I, I suppose they're, they're being remunerated for that as well. And they're or? being remunerated. Yes, we're being remunerated, remunerated for it. Let's start, let's start that again. Um, paid. They're being paid for it. Yeah. They're being paid. Yeah. Um, hmm. So um, what happens in France is there's a um, the competition process. Uh, you, you might be one of maybe 10 or 12 practices submitting. So therefore, there's a reasonable chance that you, that you, can, you can win work that way. Yeah. Um, in the UK, we have so few of these competitions that each time one goes out, oh, sorry, you'll forget. be getting 150, 200 entries. Now, you basically might as well go to the, go to, uh, you know, the, the casino and put, you know, put 20 grand on... Number ten, yeah, because the hit rate is very, very limited. So, um, so in you know, so in, in France, for example, that's you know that, that system works. I don't quite know how we shift it from one to the other because um, because it's it's you know it's a, it, you have to have you have to suddenly have a volume of these things to make it work. But 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 that's slightly separate from the construction process. So the construction process, um, I think. There is an in, there is an understanding or acceptance in uh, on the continent that quality is of it has greater importance. Mm. It's a cultural so thing. It's a cultural thing. Yeah. So so if you're commissioning a public building, there is a responsibility on the client to make sure that those buildings perform, and are, it's not simply about how cheaply you can build them. So so. Dealing with this kind of complexity and you know the, the the difficulties and the constraints of moving into public work, how yeah. has your business adapted or changed its mode of operations or its business model to be able? And what advice would you give for young practices who are wanting to move into public public work? I, I th it's still incredibly hard, uh, and I, I don't make any uh, you know any, uh, sugarcoat it. It's incredibly hard, and even now. We spend huge amounts of money on submitting um, tenders for public work, mm. um, and we've been quite lucky that most of the work that we've been winning has been through invite, invitations, invited, right. invited tenders, um, and we've got a very good hit rate with that. Uh, I think the if I were to go back a few years, we would be looking to collaborate with bigger practices much earlier on. Right. So that would be the thing. That would be to, 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 to team up with other people and, and have, some, have some unique offering that, that maybe they can't provide. Um, and because there really is no other way in, unless you want to be doing sort of, you know, pop-ups and pavilions and meanwhile uses. And things like, not that there's anything wrong with that, but it's, I think there is, um, there is a sort of attitude that Young practices, that, that's, that's what they're good at, that's all they can do. We can't trust them with a proper building, let's just do a, you know, let's do a meanwhile use for, you know, for a couple of years on the site before we get a proper architect in to, to develop it. And I think that's really unhealthy. Yeah. So I think that it's what we need to do is we need to find ways of, and it's collaborating, I think, to, get, to build up that portfolio of work. And what, what, do you th what do you think are the benefits of young practices that they can bring to these types of projects? Well, I, th I, mean, I think about... All the things that we offer that I think are unusual, not unusual, but I mean, we're, we're quite agile. We have a spe we have a specialism. I'm coming back to this I this this idea that uh, that we talked about earlier that we that we have a much greater sense of who we are as a business, mm. and as a practice, and what it is that we want to do, and what we're interested in, and what we can offer. So, our we have a, a very um, acute sense of um, of sort of uh, of social responsibility and. and how our buildings can help 
bring communities together, how they can combat loneliness, how they can uh, encourage social interaction, all those sort of things, which is quite difficult to do at a larger scale. Um, and I think that, that that's something which is which we are able to uh, we are able to bring that maybe other practices are you know larger practices aren't capable of or yeah. or haven't thought about or you know because they're you know, it's just not part of the not part of their DNA yeah um, so I think it's it is important to find a unique offering that you can that you can you know that you can bring to the party otherwise you'd just be another you know another small design team within a big practice. Um, so it is, it is about finding that 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 um, that uh, that sort of specialism um, that you can that you can offer. And what's the what's next for you guys? Well, we've had we've had a really good few months, and we've got some really uh, lovely projects um, that we are uh, that we're just just starting. So um, we just won our first school project, Brilliant. which is which is amazing, um, and. Um, uh, it's not been announced yet, but it's uh, it's a really really lovely scheme. Um, and the client went through a very nice procurement process on that. It was basically uh, had they had, they it was a short they they drew up a short list and they asked us to articulate our approach to the project rather than do a design. Yeah. And we went we did that and then we went through uh, two, a couple of rounds of interviews uh, where we met the met the staff met the met the students met some of the parents. Um, and they chose us on that on that basis. So that's that's been that's been really um, that's a really lovely scheme to keep again going with, going with. Um, We've got um, we're doing quite a lot of social housing at the moment. We're just about to do a really interesting airspace development. Um, we've got uh, we're looking at twenty three community centres for a big housing association at the moment. They're looking at ways that they could be refurbished mm. or consolidated. Uh, we're, we've, we've developed. We've actually got another business that we've set up um, to do uh, affordable housing. Um, as a sort of delivery vehicle. How come uh, you decided to, to set up a new business to, to do that? Uh, it was, it's actually a, it's a CIC, so it's a community interest company. Oh, right, so I see. so uh, the idea is that it's um, it's a combination of an architectural approach and a funding uh, uh, funding platform. So we've partnered up with a, a fintech uh, funding platform. Um, and basically, it's a it's a it's a route to home ownership uh, at very low cost, and it 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 it, uh, it works by partnering with a local authority who put the land in. We then provide a full design uh, and development handover and management package to them, so they don't have to do anything, um, which then people can buy right uh, at very low cost. And this is again come back to this idea of quality. How can we make sure that these buildings are serving the people that are going to live in them? Mm. And one of the ways that we think we can do, achieve this is by taking control of the entire process. Yeah. Uh, and so we're just working with uh, we're working with um, several local authorities at the moment. We've got we're just about to start a, a, a scheme with Barnet Council. Um, looking at, uh, I think it's around twenty odd sites where this might uh, this might apply. So we're also looking at talking to some other some other public bodies as well. So it really comes back to this idea about being a, being on, entrepreneurial and trying to find ways that um, that we can use our influence not just as an architectural solution but also an inter- in a wider interest yeah. in procurement, commissioning. You know, uh, f- social and environmental and economic. Uh, it, it, it's, it's interesting because it's it's kind of like it, you know we start this conversation talking about identity, and what I'm hearing mm. a lot is the more you've become very cl- like clear in what it is yeah. that you're about, where your interests are about, that has been the driving impetus and force for doing other yes. things in the yes. business, and yes. it's kind of made the, made it evolve the, the it's company. Been, it's been quite it's been quite li- it's quite liberating, I think. Uh, what's yeah, I think we we are we've realised actually how much influence of agency architects have, and probably don't realise it. Um, and f- f- uh, with with that knowledge, with that realisation, suddenly these other avenues open up, and you mm. think, well, actually, there's a there's a problem there that needs solving, and I can't see that anybody else is really trying to tackle this. And it might be quite specific, quite a niche problem, but you know that's an opportunity. So you know the the the, the common home uh, 
solution, which is the which is the, the thing I just described, which really came out of a conversation with with uh, these these guys, uh, Native Finance, who um, have this funding platform, and we were talking about barriers to home ownership and how that might be tackled because there is, I mean, clearly, you know, not everybody is interested in owning their own home. Yeah. Um, but some people are, and some people want to put down roots, and some people want, you know, want the security of tenure. Um, but you know, and you can you can achieve that with rental, with, with renting your home. But um, but the, I think you know, some people want to be able to, you know, to have their, their own property. So we we were trying to find ways to solve that, and it's not just a, it's not just it's not an architectural solution at all, really. It's it's an economic mm. issue. So we've developed this system. It's a combination of, of, of both, uh, both uh, you know, a standardised um, architectural approach, construction approach, and then this this sort of interesting uh, financial um, mechanism. But it's you know, but it, and it's quite it's quite a specific quite a specific um, uh, sector of the market that we're trying to. But that's fine. That's fine. We think there's an opportunity there. Yeah. And you know, and so I think that we we have this. We have this ability, architects have this ability to be able to solve problems. We're problem solvers, essentially. The problem is that we focus our problems on a very very narrow set. Yeah. And actually, if you start to apply that, if you start to think more widely about, uh, about issues that we face as a society, suddenly it becomes apparent, actually, I've got an idea there. Mm. I've got an idea that, you know, that we can... We can we can go over, we can, there's something we can something we can do about this, um, and I think that's brilliant. And yeah. I think that's what we need to do more of. And I think the, the, you know, and coming back to your point earlier about you know solving things like procurement, solving things about you know construction quality, we are uniquely placed. I think we've lost our confidence as a profession. I mm. think that's the problem. We've lost our confidence. We've 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 been sidelined, and I think it took us surprise took us by surprise, and. Uh, and we sort of we're, we're slightly punch drunk and, and staggering around trying to find find our place in the world. Uh, and I think we that it's starting to become apparent where that is. And I think that's that you know we 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 can really we can have so much influence and we can we you know I think most architects want to make the world a better place, don't they? I mean that that seems to be all the people that I know yeah. are interested in in we have to make a profit. We have to pay. The rent we have to pay staff. We have to, you know, we all got mortgages or rent to pay. You know, we have to do that bit. I think fundamentally, people want to make the world a better place, and you know, we can do that. We can do that. Love it. I think that's a perfect place to to end the conversation. Russell, thank you so much for your My time this morning. Thank you for your time. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening, and don't forget to book your fifteen-minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.